but I am happy we have a mic for that. Are we, Rashad, are we good to start? All right, I'm actually going to come right here so that Ralph is not in the way. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're getting started here. Tonight, we're doing live painting with our magic artists. First of all, I'd just like to introduce all of our artists. First, over here, we have Joe Schuler. Um, he is our art show table. Oh, sorry. Slusher. Wow, that's going to be rough. We have Joe. Slusher. I'm sorry, Joe. I've known you forever. Anyway, art show table 33, if you guys would like to go visit him. Next, we have Ralph, Hor Ralph Horsley. Which art show table are you? 38. 38, if you guys would like to go visit Ralph. We have the Steves over here. First, we have Steve Ellis, booth 57 in the art show. Then we have Steve Prescott. If someone knows Steve's art table, he doesn't know what number it is. 14. Someone knows your art show table for you. Good job. <laughs> So I guess he's 14. This is Steve Argyle. He is actually not in the art show. He's just outside of it with booth uh, 571, along with Drew Baker. He is also at Troublemaker Island, booth 40, uh, 571. Next, last but not least, we have our awesome cosplayer, Charmo Cat. So if you look up Charmo Cat cosplay, you will find her stuff. So. Tonight we're going to be doing a, it's technically a three hour painting session, but we'll only be streaming two hours of it. And so you guys will get it, see it right when it's just getting good. That's when we're going to cut off. It's like a cliffhanger. So uh, that, that's what we do. The audience here will get to see the finishing part. Um, I assume that it's kind of cool for, um, our, uh, for the audience to be able to come and go and kind of see things progress. But you guys can stay here also. Um, with artists doing this, why we do a three hour painting session is they usually break things up so that the first hour they block things out. The second hour they're working more on the colors and the contrast, and then that last hour is that refinement. So that's why a lot of artists are very trained to do a three hour painting session. Uh, we're gonna open things up for some questions from the audience here too. So if you guys got questions, start thinking on that, and we can ask the artist that. We'll interrupt the artist occasionally to ask them questions directly. Um, and um, if you guys have any other questions, just let us know. We'll kind of give you guys a guide. Um, first of all, let's talk about what the artists are using. Uh, Joe, are you, what, what painting medium are you using? Water miscible. Water miscible oils. Very cool. Ralph? I'm going to be using acrylics. All right. Steve? Uh, acrylics and acrylic inks. Wow, very cool. Prescott? Human remains. The blood of his enemies. Or acrylic. or acrylic. Argyle? Black magic. We watered, I've watered it down a little. With oil. <laughs> Braska approves, by the way. Drew, what are you painting with? Uh, I'm painting with oil paints. Because they're, they're the best. Oh, it, it was thrown down. <laughs> we're going like to get like an artist throw down here. We'll, we'll judge at the end of the show. So another thing. Hey, I said they're the best, not I'm the best. <laughs> so um, another thing is as many of these pieces might be available at the artist's booth for purchase later. Sometimes it kind of depends on the artist and if they are feeling it tonight. Sometimes they might just be like, nope, I'm sorry, this piece is not for sale. But if you'd like to follow up tomorrow, a lot of these pieces will be available for sale at the artist's booths. So that's part of the reason I'm giving you the booth numbers. You can come by and check those out. So that's that. Um, I love all the, the awesome uh, the variation in our uh, setups here too. We've got some nice wood. We've got, these guys are taped on here. Last year, Steve was actually had his um, easel set on top of a garbage can. <laughs> so <laughs> no, Argyle, sorry. Argyle had his easel on top of a garbage can. <laughs> so, eh, paint wherever you can. And I'm going to use a quote from Drew Baker, and I want everyone else to keep it in mind. Art makes life better. And that's why we're here. Because uh, I don't care how like advanced you are in art, if you can only draw stick figures, that's where they all started. And that's how every picture starts out, is a stick figure. So just art. It makes your life happier. It makes your life better. I don't care if you're a professional or just doing it for fun. Art makes life better. So, your numbers keep changing, Prescott. 
I think his name is going. His name badge is going to like slowly change throughout the night. You just painting random numbers on there to mess with me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start asking Tarmocat some questions. She's got to hold as still as she can, but still answer. You have a lot of different cosplays. I will speak for you so that I don't have to get in. Uh, yes, we're going to ask you random questions. No, that goes to the artists. Math questions go to artists. <laughs> um, what are other cosplays that you're going to be wearing this weekend or doing this weekend? Um, I'll be wearing a Yennefer. Yennefer from Witcher 3 tomorrow. Um, doing a Monster Prom cosplay tomorrow. And uh, I'll be wearing Vraska again on Saturday. Pirate Vraska. And then uh, Liliana on Sunday. Very nice. Thank you. We're really excited for that. Um, all right. Uh, something for our studio audience and our audience uh, out here. Usually, her cosplay involves these neon yellow co um, cosplay lenses. But when you sit for three hours, uh, costume cosplay lenses they dry out. It's a nightmare. So we recommended she don't wear, she didn't wear those tonight. But usually, that's an extra part. And so you'll get to see that on Saturday when she dresses up with it, she'll be wearing that. All right, so I want to open it up right here. Does anyone in the audience have any questions right now for the artist or the cosplayer? Oh, he wants to razz the artist so bad. We, I mean, yeah. oh. I don't know. I, I don't know if we can uh, roast the artists tonight. Is there any questions going on from anyone in the audience? Ah, very good question. Have any of you painted Vraska before? Anyone done a Vraska? Yeah. Have any of you painted a Gorgon in the past? You got one from Steve Ellis? Steve, you did, because uh, Damia. Damia Sage of Stone from Steve. I'm a jerk. It's because I'm trying to get in this camera right there. <laughs> He's got me right there. Yes, OK, good call. Um, I'm limited on my space. I have a chain. I have a leash. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I don't need a chair. I am sorry, Ralph. Thank you very much. Heart. Ah, that is a good one. But anyway, have you painted a Gorgon before? Not that I can remember. <laughs> huh. Steve, you were saying you'd painted a Gorgon before. Yeah. Uh, based, you know the... Um, Ray Harryhausen. There's a gallery show, and they wanted like a Ray Harryhausen piece, so I did a Medusa. Very yeah, cool. With the, with the puppet parts too. So it was like the head with the puppet parts. Yeah. Now I want to see that. That sounds amazing. Wow. Prescott, had you also you shook your head? Uh, not for magic, but I did paint for D and D. I painted a Gorgon. Long ago. Very cool. I will try to stay out of everyone's way. <laughs> Oh, I'm loving the base colors that are coming down here. This is looking amazing, guys. So um, next thing I'm actually going to, so we talked about the base paint. Um, I'm also going to talk about uh, what you're painting on. So I'm going to, again, come around. Joe, what are you painting on? An old painting. <laughs> so uh, how did you re revamp your old painting? Cleaned it up with gesso. Just took Jesso over the board. Is it just a masonite board? Ralph, what are you painting on, my friend? Uh, it's a pre-prepared, well, pre-bought canvas uh, panel. So it's just gesso canvas on a cardboard panel. Do you like a lot more tooth to your panel, or do you usually like it really smooth? If I'm using a, if I'm using a canvas panel, yeah, I like to have a bit of grain, a bit of tooth on it. It's just more fun, really, to do that, yes. Even when I do a lot of my other commercial work, I might just do it on a sketch more onto, onto card and then gesso over that. But working live like this, it's more fun to just work straight onto the canvas. You get a lot of personality with that canvas in the tooth. I like it. All right, Ellis. Uh, I'm working on uh, Arches watercolor, well, no, Fabry on a watercolor paper, some heavy duty watercolor paper. I don't even know. <laughs> this paper here. Yeah. Prescott? Working on gesso board. Just straight up gesso board? Yep. Steve. Argyle. I'm working on a Belgian linen panel. 
Ooh, that sounds fancy. Belgian linen. Mm. Drew Baker? Hi, I'm painting on an aluminum composite panel primed with Michael Harding's non-absorbent acrylic ground, I think is the full name. All right, I thought Argyle had the most fanciest, but turns out Baker threw down with a, <laughs> aluminum board. <laughs> come in here and I'm going to ask Ellis a little more about uh, how do you choose your palette and how do you set up your palette? Well, in this case, uh, well, my palette's kind of a disaster but because it's <laughs> tilted, so all the water is draining down. But uh, in what I'm doing, what I tried to do in this one was just kind of choose a color that, like, the, choose the greens and the purples as, like, a base. And then I'm going to probably pull out the blues later on. So, like, start with the darks and kind of build those out with, like, and, and then use uh, contrasting colors, like complementary colors, over top. So I, I'm going to do warm, uh, cool versus warm throughout it. But so right, I'm, right now I'm just starting with the dark stuff and trying to mix out like a muddy, gross green to get that kind of base color. Very cool. All right, I'm going to come over here to Baker. You can lift the edge up so you flatten your palette. We have now fixed Ellis's. <laughs> All right, Drew, how did you set up your palette? Uh, I put white in the corner, cools down the left, warms uh, or earth tones across the top, and then some reds where I needed them. Uh, I was looking at the model in her costume, trying to pick out what range of colors I needed to cover that. Pretty straightforward. Very cool. And, and I've already discovered I guessed a couple wrong. <laughs> Joe, how did you set up your palette? There's not a real rhyme or reason. <laughs> it's here, and I paint from it. Oh, all right. Ralph, do you have any additional thoughts on how you set up your palette? I always set up my palette very much the same way. So in the middle, I have, I'll have white, a, a mid-gray, and a Payne's gray. And then along the top, I'll go from yellow through orange to red, and then at the bottom sort of greens through blues, so it's sort of warm colours at the top, cooler colours at the bottom, and I just always tend to work the same way. So, I mean, the individual choice of colours might vary, but the way it's laid out is always the same. I like that. I always like to ask uh, different artists how they set up their palette, because it's interesting to see how they, how they work, and everyone works a little different. And um, I found with a lot of stuff, uh, as usual, it helps for everyone to kind of know different ways that artists set things up because one thing that might work for him might not work for you, but what works, works for him might help you out. So, which one? <laughs> if you pull that back up on the screen, I think you should turn it into Raska cosplaying as Harley Quinn. <laughs> All right, and speaking of, red and black. speaking of Prescott, I'm gonna come over here. How do you set up your palette? Well, I set it up on a piece of scrap paper at first. See this wonderful thing? No, I didn't want to mess Recycling. up. Recycling. I didn't want to mess up my palette from the get-go, so I just, the underpainting was on a separate piece, but I just look, this seems to be much more cool than warm, so I just put a lot more cool colors, greens, a little bit of purple in there, and just the slightest bit of warmth in there I'll start adding in certain spots, so it's random. I'll change it in the middle of a painting. I'll decide I need to go in a different direction, so this is like my starter palette. <laughs> I like the idea that you kind of keep the for uh, the prep work on the back because it takes a lot of paint and it's kind of messy. Yeah, like and you don't want to do that. Yeah, travel pal palette's pretty small. Argyle, palette setup. <clears throat> I just basically squoze every color I had onto the thing, and yeah, there's no rhyme or reason to it. All the choices. <laughs> The other artists are nodding. They said that's pretty much how they do it, but they want to just, you know, sound a little. Yeah. Sound, more sound all fancy. Well, I'll do, uh, the interplay, the 
Um, what I've seen with a lot of artists also, so we were talking about that in the beginning, they're kind of working on blocking things in and that color contrast. You'll notice that a lot of them, although I won't speak for all of them, they start with a bigger brush to get those um, color uh, contrasts in and uh, work through that. So they'll b start with that bigger brush and then they'll slowly throughout the night kind of zoom in on a smaller brush to get that detail in there. So we'll move all around there. Again, this. this is so fun. Um, another cool thing, um, we actually had an interesting thing one time when we were doing this where a guy was basically sitting over right here and he was looking at how an artist over here was painting and it looked like the model was in a completely different pose. And it's just because of his point of view versus the artist's point of view. And so it's really cool and that's why I like seeing all of these artists and bringing them all together. We're all looking at the exact same subject and yet interpreting it in totally different ways. And I love seeing that from artwork. It's so cool to, to see how people think. I think you really get into their heads and you kind of see what they're seeing. And so it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Are we gonna do co-op painting now? I was joking with the artists earlier that uh, they should choose their palette just by putting a bunch of colors into a hat and they just pick it out, they get three colors. I wanted to do that. <laughs> I told him, but then he'd be the one that got like green, purple, and pink. Although actually, that would work really well with this one, but usually that'd be kind of a nightmare of a palette. That would be a fun one. Another one that would be kind of interesting would be the idea with, with everyone involved and knowing you do switch, <laughs> switch, uh, move one down every night. Maybe next year. I, I got three artists in. Move, move, a, move down every night. Maybe we'd split the hats up into different, like warm, cold, Another thing, you're using your Gen Con cup. Did you just put your, your, your brush in your drink cup? Ellis, or is that, is that Prescott's drink cup? <laughs> is, that, is that a true danger when, when you guys are painting, mixing up your cups? I think it's even more dangerous when it comes to the oil paints. Yes, don't drink turpentine. So what I'm coordinating there, and just something we're talking about, is as we've said tonight, uh, we do, we're do we doing a three-hour painting session. We're not going to stream the whole time, but um, that's usually how artists do their pacing. And then we also promised our very, very patient model cat that she gets a break every hour. So we need to set up our uh, clocks to make sure to give people their breaks. Hmm? Woohoo! I set it up perfect. That's all I need. 
cool. Thank you. Ralph, just yell at me if I'm ever in your way. Same with you. Same with you, Joe. this down and get out of people's ways for a second. Back on. There we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, just to let you guys know, we're giving the artists a second to paint. Um, welcome back. Again, we're doing an artist painting night brought to you by Pastime Games. Uh, I'm so happy that they were awesome enough to give us this space in order to do this artwork. So we've got a bunch of magic artists here. We're gonna, we got Joe, Ralph, the Steves, and Drew. And we'll cover that a little more. Um, we actually have someone with a question in the audience. So we're going to bring them over and ask a question. Uh, how am I going to do that? I'm going around back, Ralph. All right. I am a little limited. So what's your okay. question? So first of all, I'm no artist. So this may be the wrong way to ask this. But I'm noticing everyone using a different background to start. So I see like a, a reddish pink over there, more pink, cool blue now. It started off darker. We've got a light grayish blue right here. Mm -hmm. Not much of a background at all. What's the thought process behind how you start a painting and how you pick that background starting color? And again, I'm no artist. So that's a great question. Well, and that's actually what we want is we want questions from people who maybe are wondering how this works. Um, that's a wonderful question. Joe, you're my first victim. Coming over to you, Joe. How do you choose how you start a painting? Where do you start and colors? Well, we had talked about colors, but how do you choose where to start? If it was a lighter background, I would paint in the background first, but with it being a darker background, I want to be able to go wider with my light colors, so I'm going to save the dark for last. I completely understand that. Ralph? Um, I started off with something fairly neutral and like Joe, a lighter color, because certainly we're working with acrylics that tend to work from light to dark. So, yeah, 
it's sort of finding my way at first. Um, so nothing too extreme. You can always add more colour. It's easier to add more colour. So I tend to start with more sort of desaturated colours to start with anyway. So that was my choice. And, and it's fairly sympathetic to what I'm looking at, which is a sort of greyish sort of background anyway. But picking out colours which might then work with the, uh, the colours on the, on the figure. So, yeah. I mean, exploring as you go along, really. Um, sometimes the limitation on that also is what, uh, as Ralph was talking about, is what you're, what medium you're painting with, and and if you have to go light to dark or, or how you do those colors. And something else is thinking. Are uh, you wanting to go for something that's quite complimentary? So, if if the you know the skin tone say bluish, do you want to go for a bluey purpley background, or do you want to go for something contrasting? I think I've gone for something which is more sympathetic, maybe rather than a strong contrast. And it, it also part of what goes into it is the feeling you want to put into a piece too. Um, that, that'll dictate a lot of that feel of scary, calm, things like that. All right, Ellis. Yeah. What was the question again? How do you pick what you start with? So when you started your background, you're putting a bit of a different background in. How You put a base color down, you put that purple down. Yeah. How do you pick that color? How do you start a picture? Well, what I, what I like to do is try to find like something in my head of what, what the... Uh, the bright point of the piece is going to be. So in this case, since she has, she's going to, Braska has the glowing yellow, orange eyes. So I thought I'd go with blue, uh, blue, purple, green, so that I'd have complementary colors in the yellow. Again, you know, the, so the yellow against the purple, and maybe a little bit of the warm yellow against the blue. So it'd be like kind of a, you know, basically, so that the eyes really pop out a lot. So I'm going to basically submerge the painting and then pull out the details. So I start really, at this point I started dark, and then uh, I'm doing the blues because they're gonna be kind of my, my neutral background that I'm gonna pull the other colors against. Uh, you know, that, so, but you know, each painting kind of is different, so it's like you have to kind of decide what the, where you want the eye to go. In this case, I'm gonna have people look at her eyes, so then everything else has to kind of go back and support that. You want people to turn to stone is basically what you're saying, make eye con contact. Yeah, it's actually really cool, yeah. <laughs> you're like, done! Yeah. All right, Prescott. If the piece is dark, I'll start middle tone and just keep pushing it and pushing it. And Most of the first phase of my painting is just pushing around colors and tones until it seems right. So it's really, it's a timid approach. I don't do anything too bold for like the first third of the painting while I'm kind of searching for all the shapes that I need. It's more about value, actually. Value and shapes at this point than it is about color. And then I start tweaking the color as I go along. All right, Argyle. Um, first thing I do is kind of try and find the point of interest that I want to work around. And so from my point of view, there's this really strong light that's on the one side of her face. So it's not quite a portrait, but that's where a lot of interesting transitions are happening. And so um, right now what I'm working on is just kind of getting some basic color on that. Um, but I'm going to be kind of carving into the area uh, with high contrast. Right now I'm just trying to get some basic color down. Um, but that's what I'm looking for is, is kind of a point of interest to, to draw attention to. Very nice. Baker. So I have a very strong profile to, uh, from where I'm sitting and also a very flat lighting. So the, uh, the profile is just really distinctive. So that's what I went to uh, just as a starting point was that. Uh, but really, in my experience, the most important thing is to get paint down so I can edit it. I can't edit a blank page, so uh, that, that's the important thing, is to start. It's very similar to, I know a lot of uh, writers talk about that, is uh, you just got to get something down and get going. It sounds a lot what uh, the Steves were saying, too, is kind of play with it and go from there. Um, it's what we were talking about, that first hour is kind of that shapes and, and getting a feel for things. So if anyone else has any other questions, let me know. And uh, we can uh, get that. Come over. Not anymore. And you are my victim tonight, I'm sorry. You're gonna go this way? Uh, so it's more of a question for just when you're making the magic cards themselves, do the artists start as paintings and then take them to digital, or do digital to paintings, and then how does that work? 
That's going to be different per artist, so that's a great question. Is professionally, I'm going to just change it. Like for Magic cards, professionally, it, it will be a lot different working than uh, a live painting is a very, very different beast from, from figuring out how you're going to do that. I'm actually going to go reverse order here. So, Drew, how do you start, uh, when you're doing something for a professional piece uh, for a client, it's very different from this. How do you do, how do you work? Do you do, because uh, he was talking about, do you start with a base and go digital or how are you go? Okay, uh, well the first stage is thumbnails because they, the client has their, you know, the, the things, the, the criteria you have to satisfy with the piece. So I'll start with my, my gridded notebook and I'll do a bunch of thumbnails trying to figure out, one, how do I solve their problem? And then two, more importantly, how do I solve it in a way that's interesting for me so that I actually want to finish this piece? Because um, nothing's worse than working on a dull piece that you don't care about. So I'll spend, I'll do 50 thumbnails, variations, moving the camera around, moving the light around, moving the, the gesture a little bit. And then once I've nailed the story I'm trying to tell, uh, I'll do research. Uh, I'll get uh, reference from a model, I'll get props, gather information. Then I'll do a uh, more refined drawing and find out all the things I was supposed to have figured out, but I hadn't yet, so I have to do more research. And then uh, I usually move to a painting from that. I, I can composite the reference digitally, but uh, you know, my, my end goal now is to make an oil painting. So uh, that's, that's where I go. All right. Argyle. You work a bit differently from that, actually. Uh, you, and I'm, we're talking your professional paintings. How do you work on those? So I will start with several dozen just really loose gestural uh, thumbnails. So it's just trying to figure out like where things are going to sit on the page um, and basic feeling. Um, most people never see those. What I'll do is I'll take uh, six to ten of the ones that I think are working really well and do a tighter drawing. It's not something that would pass as, a, as good work, but it's enough to get the point across that I can send to the art director so that they can see where it's going. Um, usually once the art director has approved it, um, I, go I just start painting straight on top of that. Um, sometimes I'll work out a more detailed drawing if it has a lot of detail elements or perspective things that, that actually need work. But most of the time, at that point, I'll just start coloring. That's very similar to do. You work digitally, though, mostly, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Prescott, how do you work? Oh, uh, from a client, as a client, you mean? Similar to the other Steve here, Argyle, I, when I get an assignment, I, I get a feel, usually it's like a creature or, or a figure based. So I feel if I can nail the gesture, like if I can get the energy and the emotion in the gesture right, then the rest of the stuff will start to fall into place. So I'll do, even if it's a whole scene, if I pick the one or two figures that are the most important to the piece, I'll do a bunch of thumbnails of just the figures, get the gesture right, and then I'll, if, you know, after maybe 20, I'll find the one that I like the most and do a kind of a middle range uh, thumbnail of that. Just kind of work it up from there, start putting in details, see how the rest of the piece falls together, and then I kind of assemble it from there and go to a bigger line drawing and paint from there. So it sounds like it's very different doing a professional piece than from doing these, uh, from doing a portrait painting. I, I might come back and revisit that with you guys later to kind of talk about what you enjoy between the two things and, and how you enjoy that. All right, Ellis. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, kind of the process of doing sketches, you know, is, uh, you know, is kind of standard. But my, my process is usually to get a big cup of coffee, sit down with a, a pen and scribble until and just think about what I'm doing and I scribble until I kind of see what compositional ideas come out and then once I find some of those like scribbles that look really kind of interesting then I start to go okay maybe this is a drawing and I start to kind of find edges and refine it into like a, a shadow and light kind of compositional sketch and then once I've kind of figured out that that makes sense to the story then I'll go in and I kind of carve out the details so I can send it to the art director. I mean, they sometimes my art director is very understanding because they get these what look like scribbles on, you know, coffee stained paper, like, you know, that have been stepped on and that I found late at night. And so wait a minute, this one works better than the other one I was going to send. I scan it in and send it to them. And then 
you know, they usually call me, yeah, you know, they usually email me back and say, that looks great. And then I scratch my head and try and figure out what they actually liked about it. And then that process usually is a couple days of me looking at it going, oh crap, I got to figure out what worked. And then I do it. A lot of faith involved between you and yeah. your art director. Yeah, yeah, a lot of faith. I think they, they you know, yeah. yeah, they have to have a lot of faith. <laughs> so actually, Prescott, what do you usually work in professionally? Acrylic. Is okay. that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Acrylic, if it's, I guess if it's concept design, I work digitally. Do you have a different question, though? Nope. Okay, yeah, I work digitally for concept, or digital mixed with pencil drawing. Uh, but if it's, you know, a, a full color piece, if it's like narrative, Magic the Gathering, or d and I work in acrylic. That's exactly what I was looking for. It was awkwardly worded. Sorry. Ellis. Um, I often will start with uh, ink and just kind of let the ink kind of do its thing because it, it does stuff I can't plan. And then, you know, and then I start to refine into pencil and, um, and then I'll, I'll sometimes even take the ink and just paint right on the, the, the scribbly ink and figure out the painting as I go. And actually, you're, you're one of the ones, and this is, again, why I like to ask different processes from different artists, is because sometimes they're, I mean, they have the same base ideas, but a lot of the stuff is different, and it feels like your professional process is actually, in some ways, very similar to what you're doing here, and that's really cool to see. All right, Ralph. Um, like other people, I, I, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with composition, thumbnails, composition sketches, but often before that, I'll just spend a lot of time looking for reference, because that might just trigger ideas of how you want to do it. It might not even be reference of the specific thing, certainly for like for landscapes or things like that, but the background element. It might be even looking for lighting ideas or, or, or color ideas or things like that. It's often just looking for a trigger, something that you can hook the piece around. So that might, might be a figure reference, it might be a, a reference to a particular thing, or it might just be an idea of an approach about composition. And then yes, I'll work up a, a, a series of sort of composition thumbnails, and from that, and those are actually these days be uh, probably on a toned paper, so I've got the dark value and I can add the light value on top, and then that, then from that, once that's approved, then I would do a colour study. So once I've got one of those to work from, sorry, I thought I got paint on it for a minute. There, no, I'm all right. Uh, I haven't got my apron with me. I see Drew brought his apron, but I didn't bring mine. But anyway. Um, and, and then I'll do several, sorry, just commenting on your apron. I said I forgot my ap apron. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll do a series of colour studies. So one, one little thumbnail sketch might then, might then have uh, several different colour studies based on it. Um, and something I've started to do now, because my process is a continual evolution, that's one thing that is interesting about my work, is it's not a static thing. I think that's the thing with all artists, it's not a static thing. It's not like they say, this, oh, this is how you do it getting a bit wild with my gestures here, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so even within the last six months, my process has evolved again. So something I found myself doing now is I will work up a finished sketch and then I'll, I'll, that will be scanned in and I'll print that out and I'll gesso that and then I'll paint over that. Uh, whilst before I would have maybe would have just done a quick loose pencil sketch and then painted over that. So yeah, process is an ongoing thing really. That's part of the enjoyment of what we do. I agree, and that's why I like to let people know what different processes people are working on. Yeah. Try something else. Yeah. All right, Joe. Oh, and uh, what do you mainly work in, by the way, uh, like for uh, commercial pieces? Uh, well, the color studies would be acrylic because I quite like that's quick, fast, and dirty. You can get get the the, that, the ideas down quite quickly. But then the actual finished painting would be oils. All right, Joe. So for most of my artwork, I usually focus on the light. So I do thumbnail sketches. I don't get caught up in details for a long time. And I give lots of really rough sketches to clients. Uh, the only time I do, I do it a little differently is if the focus really has to be a creature. Then I try to pinpoint something that gets me interested in the piece, like a weird, creepy smile or you know, really disturbing eyes or something. So that, that's the only time I will start with a detail when it's gonna be really about a creature design rather than a scene. Yeah. But when a scene when it's a scene you focus color or er, light a lot. That's really cool. What do you mainly work on for commercial pieces work in? I mainly use Paintstorm Studio. Very cool. So digital. Very nice. Thank you. Alright, how long we've been running here? I'm gonna check this. 
We've got 20 minutes left. Tarmocat, you're gonna be okay for another 20? All right, sounds like a plan. So in 20 minutes, we'll take a break. The artists are gonna take a little break, and then also Tarmocat mainly will take a break because this is pretty rough. I know it seems like just sitting, but we'll interview her a little after, during her break, and get some uh, opinions from her on this. And we'll actually talk over cosplay a little bit too. So if you have questions for Tarmocat, uh, in 20 minutes, we'll kind of uh, aim the questions for our cosplayer. Is there any other audience questions? All right. Uh, let's see how far I can reach out. Oh, I can't. Nope, I'm right there. So in Magic, there are different types of cards, from the creatures to the landscape-focused art to the almost action-like shots of instants and sorceries. Uh, for these artists, which ones do they like working on the most uh, that it evokes the most uh, interest in the art for that? I like it. It's a very good question. I'm going to come in here. We're going to start in the middle. Prescott. What's your favorite type of magic uh, art to work on? Uh, creature design and costume and character design. Anything, you know, figurative I like. Like if it's, I like establishing mood and stuff if that's the key to the beast, but I have the most fun, you know, kind of creating characters and creatures out of nowhere, basically. All right. Ellis, what's your favorite type of magic piece to work on? Uh, definitely, like... Any kind of the weird creatures where I can get into the design, like he said, like the design stuff, but like being able to push the edges and stuff. I'm not, I'm not really the pretty character kind of guy, so I like the really ugly, nasty, scary, you know, hideous things if I could get my hands on them. All right, Joe, I'm coming over to you next. Sorry. Figure I'll put you in the middle instead of front or end. Which, oh, I'm so sorry, Ralph. I'm so okay. mean to you. Okay. I am just brutalizing Ralph this whole night. Me and him are going to have a fight later. Uh, no, I'll feel so bad. I'll just be like, come on, right here. <laughs> All right, Joe, what are your favorite things to work on in Magic? What fa favorite type? Uh, I know probably like, it ends up being the creatures, but really anything that has to do where I can choose the lighting myself and I can convey a lot of drama through the lighting. So you like a lot of emotion to the piece or something like that. Very cool. Ralph? I, I kind of think what I... What I've enjoyed doing has changed over time, so maybe a lot of my work I've been known for in the past is very heavy figurative work and big action scenes. I certainly did a lot of that for Dungeons and & Dragons, and I've done lots of like monster type stuff and characters, but actually I've really been enjoying doing landscapes and pieces like that recently, so maybe it's just having variety. I think variety is important really for me, to be honest. All right. Uh, Baker, what is your favorite type of piece to work on for magic? Like lands or spells or? Well, I, I think uh, like Ralph, variety is really important. If there is a, I've, I've done work for other card games and there have been times where I'm getting the same thing over and over and over again. It's like eating the same meal over and over again. I just enjoy being able to change it up. I like it. Argyle. What is your favorite type of thing to work on? The Chase Mythics. Doesn't matter what they are, Chase Mythics. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Drew wants to change his answer. All right, things are progressing really well. Getting a lot of pieces, uh, getting further and further here. Starting to see more of the focus. Ah, loving these. Um, I am going to come around. Um, if you don't know, feel free. But I am going to ask the artists if they're planning on or thinking about selling their piece. So, um, and as I said, sometimes artists will work on a piece, and while everyone else is like, that was amazing, I want to buy that, it might not be something they want to sell or they're not comfortable with that. Um, it's kind of how art goes. Uh, but some of these pieces will be for sale at their uh, booths, and so I want to let you guys know, and you can go there tomorrow and check those out. Um, so I'm going to go around and ask on that, and since I'm right here in Ralph's way, are you going to be selling this maybe tomorrow, or do you do not know, know yet? Everything's always for sale of my work. There you go. <laughs> All right, Joe? I wasn't planning on selling mine. 
Okay, so not probably from Joe. Okay, Ellis, you think it's gonna be for sale? Uh, if if I can make it work, <laughs> maybe. You know. So yours is still a maybe. Yeah. And see where it goes. and like I said, it's really a, a feeling for an artist. If like well, well, someone, oh, that's amazing. No, no, I really want. Sometimes an artist just really doesn't feel like a piece hit the mark, and so it's always up to them. Prescott. Sure. Why not? Go for it. Argyle? Probably. Hope so. Again, we'll follow up a little later on that. Drew? Oh, I expect it to sell tonight. <laughs> I love the confidence. Do we have any other questions out in the audience? We really like the audience participation. So we've got a, just under 15 minutes left. I'm gonna let the artists uh, paint for about five minutes and then we'll kind of come back. We'll let them kind of just do their thing, give everyone a break for a moment to keep just arting. So I'm gonna set this down. Rashad, if you wanna turn off the one mic.
All right, guys. Welcome back. Uh, just to remind you all, we're here doing an artist painting session, mag uh, artist magic painting session. We've got our wonderful model, Tarmo Cat. She is uh, doing a wonderful Vraska cosplay for us. We are so excited. In about five minutes, we're probably a little less than five minutes, we're actually going to get to do an interview more with her, focus a little more on her while she takes a little bit of a break. Um, so we're going to get start getting a little personal with the artists and asking them some questions. Um, so get ready for that, guys. It's like long, do you like long, long walks on the beach? What's your favorite color? Um, so we're going to start asking a couple questions like that while we uh, go down. Uh, so just also, again, we'd like to thank um, Pastimes Games for um, hosting us here in their area, having this great little art area for us to do these great mar um, magic uh, paintings here at Gen Con. We're so excited. Is everyone enjoying their Gen Con, by the way? Woo! I love Gen Con. Um, when people ask the description of what Gen Con is for me, it's friend con. I could go out there on that floor and have an in-depth conversation about something nerdy with anyone on that floor, and we'd be instant friends. And that's what I love about Gen Con, is you can just bond with anyone here. It's amazing. Uh, so that's one of my favorite things about all of it. Uh, so I wanted to ask a, a quick question, uh, just to get start to get to know the artist. The basic one I'm going to start right now with is, where do you guys live? Where are you guys out of? Based out of? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Ralph. Leeds, West Yorkshire, UK. Okay. Beautiful. I love Leeds. All right. Ithaca, New York. All right. Columbus, Ohio. That's Steve Prescott and Steve Ellis. So, uh, Argyle. Utah. <laughs> Utah, all right. Drew Baker. Uh, I'm in the farmlands of western New York State near Rochester. So we kind of got a, we got a variety here. We even have some international, which you appreciate. Thank you for coming to visit us. So Steve Ellis and I live about an hour and a half from each other, and we see each other only at Gen Con. <laughs> We, we, have, we have some of those. I'm trying to figure out a good, a good term for it. There's the friends you meet on the flight. It's your single serving friends. We're trying to figure out like the con friends or something where it's like you're super close with them, but you only see them once a year at the convention. Yep. And, and you don't get enough time ever to hang out with all your friends at uh, Gen Con. It always makes me sad because it's so much fun to bring it all together. It's also a really good family convention. Um, one of the best ones where, uh, I believe it was Mark Poole used to, this was his family vacation every year. He'd bring his whole family out. He knew if his kids are hanging out with the nerds here, they're safe, they're good. He'd just let them go all weekend and just have a great time. So one of my favorite conventions, uh, just for friend con, love it. All right, we've got one minute left until break here. Do you want me to count it down for you? No, just <laughs> I'm also, I hadn't noticed it until I got over here, but um, we're going to start pointing out some stuff because we're going to do an interview with her in a second. She's got these awesome LEDs on the inside of her shoulder right there. She's got some wonderful pieces and some bright green coming down here matches that. Um, so we, we've got the, the kind of... Um, ah, bioluminous. Thank you. Very good wording. Bioluminescence coming off of the fun, uh, fungus kind of Golgari feel on all of that. I like it a lot. I, I actually, I'll be totally admit, I was completely selfish. Uh, I was at, she asked which cosplay I wanted her to do. And I was like, I want the Vraska. And I kind of want the really Golgari, like super deep, like I love the texture to all of it. And so that's why I, I selfishly picked this one, is because the texture and, and fun on it. All right, cat, Tarmo Cat, we are done right now. So, I'm gonna set my timer right here. Though. Setting my timer. Yeah, you'll have a 10 minute break. Uh, but if I could, for the first part of your break, I'm going to come up and interview you a little bit and ask, and I might get some questions from the audience, too. Yep, but stand up and stretch and talk to me. All right. So where are you wandering around this con? What are you doing for most of it? Um, I'm 
mostly hanging out with my wonderful um, cosplay group of um, mostly magic cosplayers. I see Vanessa and Mason out there. Um, yeah, so we have like a monster prom group. Um, we have a sailor planeswalkers group that we're going to wear on Sunday. That's I'm really excited about it. So yeah. That's very cool. See, I gave all the artists booth numbers, and I'm just trying to kind of figure out how to let people know where you are and find you, where, where um, you're going to be. Probably mostly around this area, mag the magic area. So, yeah. All right, so where is your internet presence? Pimp yourself. Tell us all about you. Um, so I'm on everything. I'm Tarmo Cat. Um, my favorite card is Tarmo Goyf, as you probably figured, and my name's Cat. So, yeah. Very cool. All right, so where are you Where are you currently from? Um, I'm actually from Indy, so I had She's a, whopping, a local. whopping 30 minute drive to get here. That's pretty rough. I know. Probably made it a bit easier to have the support of being able to get ready at home and get um, everything. Actually, I did not drive downtown in this outfit. Um, I came down here and I have some friends that are staying across the, the street and I got ready downtown. Everyone always asks it. I know it's a common question. How long does it take for you? This costume in particular, how long does it take you to get into costume? So the the costume takes about, I don't know, all of two minutes to put on. But the makeup itself, it probably takes me about an hour and a half, two hours. So, yeah. That's actually, that's a lot shorter time than I thought. Yeah, Good job on that. I don't have very much patience for makeup. So if it took longer, I probably wouldn't do it. Done. Yeah. All right, and then the next question I know a lot of people ask, and so I do want to kind of hit those topics. How long does it usually take for you to put together a cosplay piece? Uh, totally depends on the costume. Um, so this one had a lot of details, like um, like the surging on all the mushrooms. Um, I made a lot of mushrooms for this dress, and mushrooms over here. Um, and then the snake piece itself was pretty labor intensive, so. This one is probably the cosplay that's taken me the most time, and I honestly could not quantify it because um, I, I just break up uh, cosplay work in any free time that I have. Um, so this one took me a few months to make. And then, you know, I have some more simple cosplays. Um, then I have, like, Liliana, who I made the original, and then I've evolved her over time as the Liliana artwork has evolved and her characters changed. So, I don't know, question marks, I guess. I think that is a lot, I've seen that with a lot of cosplayers where um, it starts out and yeah, the initial base time put in and then, well, I want to add this and yeah. I want to put this and I don't want to do this. Or you wear it once and you're like, oh my gosh, I really need to fix this or this is not practical at all and you change it up, so yeah. What is your favorite part about cosplay, like your favorite part to do in putting things together? Is it the design? Is it the stitching? Is it the, yeah, what's your favorite so, part? So I love, um, I love like the, I mean, I think most of the magic cosplayers love the art in magic. And like when I saw, I never thought I would cosplay Vraska. And then I saw Vraska Golgari Queen, Mogali's artwork for it. And I just was like, I have to cosplay this. I mean, it's so beautiful. And then it was just like probably at least a month of brainstorming and thinking, how the heck am I going to make like a snake head? And how am I going to make all these mushrooms? Um, and I know, like, for me, I'm a big seamstress. Like, that's my comfort zone. But then I have friends who make these amazing, like, armors of, or suits of armor out of foam. Um, I'm horrible with foam, but I can so I mean, I'll try to make anything with fabric that I possibly can. So, um, but yeah, I like the challenge of taking the art and making it a reality. Yep. And um, you'll notice a lot of these questions are actually very similar to the ones we were asking the artists. This is art. And so we're talking, hey, what, what mediums are you working with? What is your favorite medium when you work on it? It's very similar to the questions. The next question I'm actually going to ask is the same one we asked the artist. Where do you start? Like, how do you, how do you start this process? Um, well, for for Vraska, it was it was actually um, if I could successfully make a snakehead because if I couldn't, there was no point in making the rest of it. Um, so I really I just started with a snakehead. Um, like Lilian, I started with a dress. Um, Death Right Shaman, I started with his robes. Uh, so there's kind of a focus point that yeah. you're like, that. that's what I want. Start from there, and then you can kind of evolve um, outwards. So, yeah. Very nice. Is there, uh, all right, so I know personally with art, with artist pieces, I have favorites. Like, like, it's a weird little thing, but it's like, I love this finger on this piece here. Show us your favorite thing on this costume. What is that piece that you just want to show everyone and right. you wish they all noticed? I love I love Vraska's like mushrooms on her dress. Um, 
I I love I love to eat mushrooms and I think like mushrooms are adorable and I I love the whole Golgari feel like the very earthy like gritty vibe and the textures. Um, so when I first saw the artwork, I was just like, I can't believe Magali painted a mushroom like dress. I mean, it's just so cool and. It was the ultimate excuse to make a, a gown of mushrooms. You do like your Golgari. I know yeah. that you also have a, you, you do have your death right shaman outfit and he's also very Golgari, yep. mushroomy too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely, I'm always playing like a green black variation, so. Yeah. Steve's pretty green black too. Ar Argyle, sorry, we're doing that. Do, do we have any questions from the audience? All right, uh, you have to come to me. <laughs> the artists are being the peanut gallery. They, they, they've shifted around and now they're hanging out in the, the audience. And then I'll let you get to your break. Sure, but yeah. um, we don't get to ask you many questions. All right. So what goes into picking what you want to cosplay? Is there like a favorite character or a favorite kind of theme you go with? Um, for me, it's funny because I always say I'm going to take a break from making cosplays and then new art comes out and I see it and I'm like, oh, I have to make that. Um, so it was the same way with, with this costume. I never imagined I would ever cosplay Vraska. I mean, I thought she was a cool character. And then I saw the new artwork with Ravnica and I was just blown away. Um, and I think a lot of the other cosplayers are the same. Like you just see a card and it just speaks to you and just like, I don't know, grabs your soul. And I mean, for me, that's that's how it is. So. Very cool. All right, we had another question in the back. Sorry, you have to find your way up here, but and then we'll let uh, Tarmo Cat go free. Free, free, free. See, we we made things easy here tonight. We've got two cats, and then we've got a bunch of Steves, and then those guys. So we try to make it easy. Hi. Hi. Uh, a big thing that people focus on is the before process and the during process. But what goes into the behind the scenes afterwards? How do you, you know? Uh, maintain your body when you you know put it through all the makeup and everything how do you take care of yourself afterwards oh gosh yeah taking everything off at the end of, end of the day if you're wearing like corsets you've got like lines all over and um, taking all the makeup off I mean I know a lot of us do like face masks after before and after conventions because of all the makeup um, so yeah investing in like some really good makeup remover and sleep afterwards and yeah so Taking breaks. Breaks. That's what, okay, and speaking of, we'll let you take your break. So um, I think there actually is a um, okay. stairway right there to escape. Um, all right. Um, the, all right, Rashad, we're going to give it a break for a second. I'm going to put down the
Do 20 minutes from here and then. All right, people, welcome back. Thank you for coming back with us. We're here at Gen Con 2019 in the uh, Magic the Gathering area hosted by Pastime Games. We're doing a wonderful portrait painting night with all of our artists of magic um, and our great and very patient model, uh, Tarmocat. Oh, all right, we'll get that in a second. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go back through a roll call for our artists. I'm going to mess this up. Joe, I'm scarred. So anyway, this is Joe Slusher. Yay, Slusher. I said it wrong earlier. Anyway, I'm going to get it right. And he is at table 33 in the artist Sally. Um, next, we have Ralph, Ralph Horsley, and he is 30, 38. I was right. He's 38 in the artist Sally. Steve Ellis, number 57 in the artist Sally. 57. All right, Steve Prescott is um, 14 in the Artist Alley, though he has lots of random numbers on there. Maybe it means something. It's a combination to my high school locker. A combination to a high school locker, yes. It's his pin for his credit card. <laughs> pin for his credit card. <laughs> Social security. Yay. Steve Argyle is actually not in the Artist area. He's just outside of it at booth 571 on Troublemaker Island, along with Drew Baker, who is also at booth 571. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of troublemakers there. It's Angle, Argyle, and Baker. It's, that's what we call it. It's great. <laughs> and then again, Tarmocat. And she'll be doing a lot of different car, cosplays throughout the weekend and wandering on the floor. Uh, we'll be back streaming for another 20 minutes. Um, we'll still be doing the live show for a while yet. We've still got... Um, an hour, 40 minutes about for the live show, uh, but we'll only be streaming for another 20 minutes. Uh, let me look at my clock here and make sure I have a good timer on that. Okay. So the viewers on the internet will only get the ugly. <laughs> uh, so they've, the artists have already been painting a little over an hour, and so this is kind of where it's at, but they plan on doing a total of three hours. Some of these paintings will be for sale uh, at their booths, and that's part of the reason I'm telling you booth numbers, is so that you guys can go check those out. Um, it really depends on the artist, though. If they're not happy with the piece and not comfortable with it, they might not put it up for sale. So that's kind of how that goes sometimes. Uh, we're going to start to get into things. Um, I'm actually going to help uh, promote them on the internet presence. So, Joe, where do people find you on the internet if they want to look at your stuff? Just joeslusher.com. Joeslusher.com. Ralph. Just Google Ralph Horsley. There you go. No website? Yeah, you'll find it. It'll come up at the top of the list. Very confident. I like it. It's, it's, I've got an unusual name. It helps. Unique helps. All right. Steve Ellis. Uh, SteveEllisArt.com. But watch out for the other Steve Ellis. He's also a painter and he does gallery art. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm usually Steve Ellis Art on all social media stuff too. Do you like stare him down? Are you gonna like have a like art off between you and the other Ellis? I actually used to get his mail when I was living. He lived in Manhattan on 10th Street. I lived in Brooklyn on 10th Street, and I got his mail every once in a while. It was, and we had these really uncomfortable kind of interactions. Wow, you you were also as well as on the internet close. You were yeah. locationally yeah. close. Steve Prescott, where do we find you on the internet? Uh, two places: steveprescott.com and rotface.com. Rotface. Why the two? I'm terrible with the internet thing. <laughs> you hate yourself and want to update two sites? <laughs> yeah, I don't really update my sites. They're at least 30 years old. They were before the internet, actually. <laughs> and they just magically appeared by the power of art. All right, Steve Argyle, where do we find you on the internet? SteveArgyle.com. Awesome. Straightforward. Drew Baker, where do we find you on the internet? Oh, that's, I don't know. You can email me, drew at drewbaker.com, or my Instagram is drewbakerart. My website is super terrible. It, 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 it's super terrible. All right. So I'm going to come through. This is... A this is a common question that I know a lot of artists get, but uh, people are, they're inspired by you guys. 
So we also want to know who are your inspirations in art? Who, what made you want to become an artist? Who made you want to become an artist? Joe? Uh, probably Wayne Barlow, uh, Mark Teton, uh, Ron Spencer. It's probably the top three that inspired me as a kid. Awesome. Ralph? Um, all, all the early D&D stuff, really. I grew up playing AD&D, and it was all those black and white line drawings that did it for me, really. <laughs> Same here. All right, Ellis. Uh, Bernie Wrightson and Frank Rosetta. I'm kind of easy, but that's it. <laughs> I think you'll actually find, especially with artists that are um, sci-fi fantasy artists, they have a lot of similar inspirations. And you'll actually probably see when someone over here says one, someone over here will be like, yeah, that one, that one. <laughs> All right, Prescott. Uh, Mike Mignola and Stan Winston. All right, Argyle. Brom, Boris Vallejo, Donato, um, and a lot of old comic book artists like Jim Lee and uh, Alan Davis. That's where it really started with me was comics. Drew Baker. I, I just want to say, hearing Jim Lee referred to as an old comic book artist, because that was when I was in high school, was really shocking. <laughs> just this moment. Um, probably, uh, well, mostly my dad, uh, because there was always drawing around the house and then we saw sci-fi fantasy book covers and like Charlie Russell was one of my dad's favorites so he was around yeah so more western art than uh, sort of old school fantasy very cool all right and Drew we're gonna come back around and re wheel back around this way again um how did you know, this one's a complicated question. How did you know when you wanted to become a professional artist? Or is there a moment that you kind of had or is it just something you've always kind of gone through? How did you know you wanted to be a professional artist? Or was there a point you figured it out? Yes. Oh, I'm still not sure about it. I'm kind of on the fence, we'll see. <laughs> Drew's still figuring that out. What's your backup job, Drew? <laughs> uh, Walmart greeter? That's one of the reasons I'm still an artist. I really can't get out of it at this point. I'm not qualified for anything else. <laughs> All right. Steve, was there a point in your life when you realized that? It's when I started running out of money for college. See, Prescott, did you have a more, like, moment or, or time in your life when you realized you wanted to be an artist and really started going for that? Uh, I think it was after I saw the movie Aliens is when I really was like, this is the shit that, this is the stuff that I want to do. <laughs> so yeah, I started with that, like that, like I was drawing long before that, but at that point I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to get mediocre grades in the rest of my school, except for art class. That was a conscious decision. Yeah. Eh, mediocre here, let's focus on art. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ellis. Well, my story's a little weird. I, uh... When I was like 17 years old, I drove my car into a tree, and I kind of decided at that point that my dad was trying to get me into architecture, uh, and I was like, no, I just want to paint and draw if I can, anything I can get my hands on. So uh, at that point, I was like, well, I, one of those, like, I only have one life kind of realizations, and I was like, well, I better do it. That was it. You really did have an art epiphany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Very cool. Ralph. Um... It was when the, I was coming towards the end of my degree in English literature and librarianship and decided I didn't really want to be a librarian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I had, been, I had been doing a lot of fanzines and I, I, I was getting stuff published. I suppose it's when I got my first role-playing game illustration published and thought, heck, I can get 50 quid for doing this or I can be a librarian. I think I'll try and earn more 50 quids. <laughs> That's one thing that I really want to point out uh, with a lot of these artists is... is um, they talk, I'm talking about that point where they decided that's what they want to do professionally. I, I, these guys can disprove me if I'm wrong, but these guys have just been arting their whole life. All of us start out doing art when we're little, and we kind of hit like 12 years old and just stop. What happened with this is these guys just didn't stop. They just kept going. And so uh, even if you guys stopped, you can pick it up again. Art makes life better again. So, all right, Joe. Did you have a moment or anything like that in your life? Yeah, I'd say so. So I grew up with a mother who really hated her job. 
And I think it was just one time she came home and she's just really miserable. And I thought, God, I better pick something to do for a living that I'm going to enjoy, even if it doesn't. You know, don't don't pick a career for money. So that's that's how it happened. And that, that epiphany moment, I, I want to enjoy what I'm doing. I like that. I suppose that's the same thing for me, really. <laughs> yeah, did you have it? Your parents worked and you're always kind of well, miserable? No, the epiphany moment of not being a librarian. <laughs> yeah, it was your own personal one. It's like, oh, gosh. Very nice. May I ask how old you were when you were when you kind of had that transition moment of being a librarian to, uh, well, to uh, art? To be a bit more serious, I think the thing was I didn't really think you could make a living doing art. So it was my passion. It's what I did all the time. It was like my hobby, my, my interest and whatever yeah. else. But I didn't see it as a career path. It was all my like people that did the art for D&D were some mythical thing. that I couldn't see the connection between what I did and how you would do that. And I think I just got to the point where I thought, well, I'm going to try anyway. I don't really know how you do it. Yeah. And I'm a little bit older maybe than some people here. And I, it was sort of pre-internet day, so it was a lot harder to really do that. And even when I started out, I was working for people. But, it, but work, the idea of working for American clients was really seen beyond my scope because how would you do it? You know, because the, the early work I did do, you were still mailing off sketches and photocopies and things like that. And, you know, so the idea of how you would do that transatlantically just didn't figure for me. So the internet made a huge, huge difference, and I think people are very fortunate starting out now that they have that advantage. Well, and with the uh, internet, th we need more art than ever. Yeah. You, you need things that make things pretty, um, and so it's actually progressed more and more. Um, I've uh, talked to a lot of artists um, who, um, Todd Lockwood uh, talks about some of the stuff that um, Ralph was just saying, where, um, Back in the day, it was very hard. When you had a piece, you had to figure out how to photograph it, how to um, or, or how to scan it, or anything like that, and get it to your client. Um, you usually had to ship it. How do you ship these originals? Everything like that. I, I, I know that one thing. My sketching style for a long time was molded around the fact that I used to photocopy my sketches to send them off. And the local photocopy shop, well, it was actually it was the post office. And it was always really low on toner, so I had to do really heavy mark making, or else it wouldn't show up. <laughs> so the bad printer affected your art style and has influenced it to this day. That's wonderful. Um, but and, and if you could stop and think about how that used to work and how difficult that was, they'd have to ship these pieces off. And so as well as like the due date, hey, we have to have this in six weeks. But you also, two weeks of that has to be shipping and you need to make sure it gets here and it gets here intact. And, and drying a piece, if you were working in oils, trying to get it to dry in time to send off to your client. I think as well though, because of that, and because everyone was understanding of that, you had a lot longer lead time on stuff. So actually, if anything, deadlines were a lot longer because people had to allow a lot more time for that process. So yeah, that's, that's something that is different because people maybe expect something a bit more instantaneous now because it can be. Yep. And you can still you can still photograph or scan in your uh, wet pieces now. <laughs> you don't have to wait for them to dry. Uh, that's also why um, a lot of times uh, classically uh, people had the numbered pieces. Is when you did a print run, it took a long time to set up the printing, and they did the proofs and everything like that. Um, it, it was a big process, and it cost a lot of money to do a print run. So that's why they did those limited edition one out of a hundred it's just because it took a lot more work than just your printer at home or, or the sudden quick uh, ability to print things out now uh, I, I imagine there's actually someone on the floor doing it where they have a computer here and just can print on demand the artwork and so it's great to see how technology has influenced and changed what we're able to do and yet these people are still here doing traditional art um, that's actually something we uh, want to come back to and, and bring up is um, uh, I think yep we still got a little bit of time left on our stream here um, what I want to come back and ask is um, what's the difference between working on a completed piece and working working on a portrait and what do you enjoy about both uh, and those differences there Joe so there's a lot of differences between working on a portrait like this and having someone sit for you and working on a commercial piece. How, like, what do you enjoy about working just quick and three hours time box versus having a more time to plan? And 
I could say that working from life is kind of nice because you're not having to develop ideas on your own. As far as client work, I like that I can jump drastically to like a new direction, whereas I can't change direct. Well, I can sort of change direction, but not much. Um, actually, that brings up another thing. I was I was talking to Joe earlier and uh, kind of BSing with him, and uh, he was painting. He goes, "Oops." <laughs> so uh, that's actually a side question. Then that. What do you do when a piece goes sideways, like especially when it's a, a, a traditional piece like that? How do you handle that? You don't just leave it there. You definitely try to. I, I mean, I can't help but try to fix it. I'm gonna try to paint over it, do it, scrape it out. A lot of times, when I would do still life painting, you'd scrape the whole painting down. So you just keep revising. Well, you are painting over another piece right now. You are painting over another piece right there. All right, Ralph, what do you enjoy about the doing the portrait session quick 30, uh, time three hour piece versus more thought out? Well, I think that's the thing. It is a quick, quicker session. It is less thought out. Maybe that's the fact that it is a bit more spontaneous and yeah, and maybe a bit less pressures. And, and that's quite nice really, not to have the same sort of pressures. I think sometimes you'll get something that's an accident here too and you're like, oh, oh, let's go with that. So what do you do when a piece goes sideways? And Oops, moment. I don't, I don't know. It's funny that because I don't generally feel that about a piece. You can sometimes feel like you're losing control or something, but I don't, this, it's rare you make one mark and go, oh, it's all gone wrong. You Until might. I kick your easel, <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, you can have accidents. That's a different thing. Yeah, you can spill things and, and whatever. But, but generally speaking, things, things for me feel like more it's an evolution of something that's going on. So you might find you're not quite getting the results you're wanting, but you just keep pushing it back towards that. And some mediums are, are more forgiving. That's why I think I quite liked acrylics for a long time. I used to work more in acrylics than oils because I, I found it a very forgiving medium. You could, you could go over it again. I know people, maybe students or whatever, said, well, how do you manage without control Z? And it's like, well, you don't go back. You just go over. You just carry on evolving it, really. So it's not a case of you suddenly go, oh, wow, it's gone horribly wrong. I mean, you can find maybe like, OK, that face is shifting away, not looking quite how I want, and try and pull it back. So yeah, that's just part of the process, really. It's, it's not. It's not right or wrong, it's just the way you paint. An evolution, kind of. And that's a lot that happens here with these just three hours to draw. All right, Ellis, what do you like? So the question is, what do you like with these three hour drawings versus uh, being able to, versus your more commercial pieces you have more time to work on? Um, I think it's the immediacy, the, the almost the, 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 not fear, but like this almost excitement of like, this could all, fall to hell at any second so you're kind of like walking on a tightrope and it's just exciting and you're and you're you're interacting in a way with them with the model that like you don't get when you're working off a photograph or if you're walking off sketches you really can get like a I don't know resonance I don't know it sounds really woo woo but you get like a resonance from the model and it it helps inspire what you're doing it's just that life interaction I like it what do you do or have you ever had a piece go sideways what do you what happens when it just well, what I've done, what I've done in the past is I'll, I'll like stop, take a photograph it, of it, jump into, uh, uh, scan it, send it to my computer, mess with it on the computer, go, oh, okay, that, and figure it out there, and then go back to the paint. That way, I'm, you know, like it's like a extra sketch version, you know. Oh wait, stop. Let's figure this out. Yeah. What about if it's a live painting like this? Just keep going. Yeah. yeah. Plow through. Yeah. All right, Prescott. Yeah, what was the question again? So the question is, um, what do you enjoy and what are those differences between doing these three hours set time paintings versus like a, a, a full uh, professional piece? Yeah, so this is much less meditated. So there's, there's a little bit of prep time, but really I'm not trying to think out a high concept. I'm not trying to like orchestrate the perfect composition for reproduction in a, in a product or anything like that. You're just kind of jumping in and the, the looser you are, the looser your approach at the beginning, the better. So like I like I like having that release already. Like knowing going in that I can start loose and stay loose and just kind of push color around. Like so that makes it, you know, it's kind of a different animal. It's more fun in that way. But you know, the other way is fun too. Just it's good to loosen up sometimes. So next, the follow up question is what happens when it goes sideways? A eh, big mess up. Oh gosh, that's the wrong color. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? That happens all the time. <laughs> um, it depends on the kind of mess up or how big the mess up is. Usually I can recover just by taking a step back, 
and whatever's bothering me, if it's been bothering me for long enough, I just take a bigger brush and just kind of scumble over it, like just kind of mess it up on purpose, just so I like lose all trace of what was going wrong and I just kind of pick out the new way, new path through. A lot of times I've just started over a painting if it's just awful and I, it, like it just has like a bad vibe about it. I know I can't, I can't recover from this. I gotta start from scratch. <laughs> Game over, restart. Yeah. Very nice. All right, Steve, what do you like for from a, a traditional or from the, the painting like this versus what you do every day for work? Um, so the, the live sessions are, I feel like you learn a lot more because so many decisions are not flattened for you already um, from like using photographic reference, things like that. Um, and I like the improvisational feel where you don't have time to change your mind you got to just keep going it's that like improv of yes and you're just okay well I put this mark down doesn't matter if you like it you just keep building on one after another after another so they don't always turn out but you always learn some things and it, it for me at least it feels like it makes me faster and more thoughtful that's the one thing I actually say to a lot of our uh, people when they're doing this is so how did it turn out if they're like eh, I'm like well did you learn something and did you enjoy yourself? Even if it doesn't turn out, if you enjoy uh, if you enjoy yourself and you learn something, it's really important. All right, Drew Baker. I think this is going to be our last question, and then we'll kind of summarize up, and uh, we'll let the streamers go, but we'll keep it going over here. Drew, what do you enjoy about doing a live portrait painting session versus uh, what you do usually for in uh, your studio? Yeah. Well, the the biggest difference again with doing a studio piece is you have a lot of time to consider or procrastinate. Whereas something like this, I, I have this narrow window of time and I've got to make the most of it. You've got to act, you've got to move quickly uh, and live with your choices. It's kind of that what you're talking about is just get something on the, get paint down. So what happens when you do, when something just goes sideways, a big mess up? Oh. Let, me, let me jump back again. Um, this January, I was doing some quick paintings, uh, sketches from life and then some quick paintings uh, every day. And the, there were times I had 45 minutes to do a quick oil painting, or, or an hour or 45 minutes was what most of them were. And uh, you know, compressing the time even more led to uh, me being a lot better at working quickly. There was a, a marked difference that I could feel between December and February uh, just doing that. So if you think doing three hours is quick, try even pushing it further. So it's that learning time. Um, I know that Bob Ross, actually a lot of people didn't know that, how Bob Ross got his start is that um, Bob Ross was in the military, and he just had small breaks in which he could work, and so he learned to work very, very quick, and so that's how he learned that very, very fast style, is he was in the military, and he only had short breaks. I actually have another friend who's in the military, and what she does is during her lunch break, she'll ask someone to sit for her, and she did 10-minute sittings of three different people, and just as quick as she could, just to learn and just improve. Uh, Drew, we didn't ask you on what happens when it goes sideways, what happens when it messes up? Sometimes it just goes in the bin. Sometimes you can save it. I was having uh, you know, trouble with one getting a nose right. And then during a break, came back and looked at it. Oh, the problem wasn't the nose. The problem was the chin. You just have to figure out what's going on. Yeah. It's kind of like these, uh, the Steves were saying, is sometimes you just need to step back. You're sitting there fiddling on something, fiddling, fiddling, and you step back and it's like, oh, oh, it's this. So That's very great. So we're actually at that exact point where we're going to let the streamers go. We appreciate all the time. Uh, we just want to, all the artists, thank all the artists for uh, painting for us tonight. We'll go through it quickly again. We've got Joe Slusher. <laughs> Joe, your name scares me, Slusher. Ralph Horsley, Steve Ellis, Steve Prescott, Steve Argyle, Drew Baker, and Tarmocat is our model. Um, we've got a wonderful host here with Pastime Games and Gen Con in the Magic area. This is in Hall B. We hope that you guys can join us. They'll be doing this again tomorrow night. Um, we'll have, uh, tomorrow night is Olivia, I believe, is our model. Uh, so she'll be here, and I know that Drew Baker is going to be painting again. I'm not sure about any of our other artists, but we know that that's going to be happening. So we'll be back here again tomorrow night. Uh, same time from 7 until 9, streaming. Uh, so uh, I think we'll have a different host tomorrow, because uh, I'll be doing True Dungeon. But uh, we'll also be doing this again on Saturday and have a bunch of uh, people back here again. So we hope you can join us one of these times. 
So thank you guys so much on the stream. We appreciate you following along. If you want to see, this is like one of those like cliffhangers. If you want to see these finished pieces, you got to come by and uh, check things out uh, at these artist booths. Hopefully some of these artists might take pictures of their uh, final pieces and post them online. So I recommend following up on these artists so you can see the finished pieces online. Thank you so much to our streamers. Thanks, guys.